All right, well, this morning we're going to look at how Paul uses the resurrection in his message. We actually read in 1 Corinthians 15 that the resurrection is a part of that message, not the entirety of it, but certainly a very, very important part. And we want to see, uh, well, we want to see how the world responds to it. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 17, uh, but that doesn't really matter. It matters to them, of course. It matters for their well-being how they respond to it. If they reject it, scoff at it, don't believe it, they're not going to be saved. But um, that shouldn't matter. What should matter to us, of course, is the fact that Jesus actually did uh, rise again from the dead, that he is alive. And we want to understand what that means for us. As I mentioned before, we want to see the importance of the resurrection, uh, just how it really is the vindication of our Lord Jesus, of what it is he said, what it is he did. Um, it proves that all he said was true. It proves that all he did actually does save. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. I'll read to the end of the chapter, but we're really going to be focusing on verses 30 and 31. This is what Luke writes. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown god. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and, the th and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are, are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing. You know, one thing that just struck me as I was reading this, it was a little bit distracting, was verse 29, where Paul says, being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like silver, or gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. It just occurred to me that that is really the apologetic we were looking at before. How could we have come from this gold or this stone image when we are flesh and blood who think and have all these various attributes? We have personality, self-awareness, intelligence, all these things that they don't have. This could not have been the cause of, of us. Neither could the earth or the ground. 
what caused us must have what we have and must be greater than us. But again, Paul doesn't focus on that so much as he focuses on the gospel. He does find that point of contact with the culture that he's ministering in that he can use as a door uh, to open up what it is he has to say. But as we mentioned before, when you're offering this defense, you need to get to the gospel, and that is what uh, Paul is doing here. And what we want to focus on, particularly this morning, is how the resurrection fits in this. Now, as we know from, from Scripture on one occasion, when Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. He was the expert in the law. He was the one who knew all things. Nicodemus, he realized, didn't even understand the basics of what the Bible taught, so he told Nicodemus, and he really summarized everything the Bible has to say in one sentence, and it's a sentence we often use to share the gospel with others, John 3.16. He says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He was telling him here that God, the, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or in this case, the Father representing the three persons of the Godhead, loved the world so much. And by the world, he's talking about a world of fallen men. He's not talking here just about those he's chosen, those who are going to receive the gospel eventually. He gives Jesus to the whole world, even though we were in rebellion against him, that he gave him willingly, purely out of his love and his mercy, because we certainly did not deserve that God would give to us that which was most precious. He gave his only begotten son, the one he loved the most, the one who was with him from all eternity, who is himself God, he gave him Jesus, that whoever believes, whether Jew or Gentile, whoever trusts in him alone to save them, he says, shall not perish. That is, won't have to face the wrath of God, God's justice for their sins, we will not receive what it is we deserve for the sins that we have committed, but instead will have eternal life. Essentially, that's what the grace of God is, giving us something we don't deserve. Justice is giving us what we actually do deserve. Grace is giving us something good that we don't deserve, eternal life. We will become the children of God and live with Him forever in heaven. So this is the summary of the entire Bible. This is what it's about. Man fell into sin. God purposed to send his son in order to save all who will trust in him. But we do know that having, of course, determined to do so and God having determined that in eternity, there were certain things Jesus had to do when he actually came into the world to become our Savior. He had to become one with us. We know the Bible says... We are the ones who sinned. We are the ones who owed the debt. We are the ones who had to pay it. And so Jesus becomes one of us. In order to make that payment, the eternal Son of God takes upon himself our nature, is conceived and born of the Virgin Mary. He had to do what it is we failed to do. We didn't live the life God called us to live. We failed at the very get-go, as it were, and coming into the world guilty and sinful. We did nothing but fail our entire lives. Well, Jesus came into the world and he lived the life that the Father actually called all of us to live. That's the only way we can enter into heaven. The only way we can be with God is if we are the kind of person that God is, one who loves what is good and right. That's the kind of person Jesus was. And of course, Jesus also, if he was to save us, had a debt that he had to, to take care of for us. He had to die on the cross. We disobeyed God. We sinned against Him. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's what the penalty is. Jesus took that penalty. He took the guilt, our guilt, the guilt of everyone, whoever had believed in Him or whoever would believe in Him for all time, upon Himself, and He suffered God's wrath on the cross and died in our place. He died in our place if we are trusting him. He paid the price 
for us. And by the way, that is the love of God, isn't it? That he would give that payment for us when all we deserved was his wrath and that payment being the one he loved the most. But of course, Jesus also had to be raised from the dead. He had to overcome death for us. So he could not remain dead. Now this morning, Paul points to the resurrection, to the philosophers of the Areopagus, as the evidence or the proof that God has given to us. His apologetic, his defense that Jesus has overcome death and that everything he claimed to be, he actually was. And that he has overcome death, not just for himself, but for everyone who trusts in him. Now, this morning, I really I want us to look at four things, four ways in which the resurrection vindicates who Jesus is and what he's done. I want us to look at, first of all, the fact that the resurrection proves that Jesus is the Messiah, the only Savior of mankind, and the only way to God. I want us to look at, secondly, that, that the resurrection proves that what Jesus did, the payment he made, was actually accepted by his Father as payment in full for our sins. Thirdly, I want us to see that the resurrection proves that Jesus will be given the honor of judging the world at the last day. And then, most importantly, this morning, I want us to see the resurrection proves that if we repent and trust in him, we will be saved from that judgment, from what the Bible calls the second death, which is eternal punishment in hell forever. Now, first of all, the resurrection proves that Jesus is the Messiah. That's certainly what he claimed to be, the one the Father has sent into the world to be the Savior of all mankind. Now, last week we were looking at some of the ways that the Bible shows itself to be God's Word, to be more than just uh, the, a collection of human writings like other books we might find in a library, that these words are special that God inspired them by his Holy Spirit, they are infallible, they are inerrant, they are his very word. Now, one of the ways in which we know that this is the word of God is prophecy. The Lord guided the authors of this book to write down events that were yet to take place centuries before they actually did take place. Now, that's what he did with regard to the resurrection. Now, he actually tells us first through uh, King David that the Messiah, and this is again written many hundreds of years before Jesus came into the world, that when he came into the world, he would in fact be put to death on a cross. Now, we were just reminded that that's what Jesus had to do in order to satisfy God's judgment for those who would believe in him. He had to lay down his life, but he would do so on the cross. Now, we do know from reading the gospel accounts that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, he did that for a variety of reasons. The first reason was because as he bore our sins in himself, he was alienated from his father. That fellowship between the man Christ Jesus and his father was broken, and so he cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? But that wasn't the only reason. He also did that to fulfill prophecy because he was pointing to a specific psalm in the Psalter that spoke about the crucifixion and he wanted those who were around him to know that he was fulfilling that very thing at that time. We read in Psalm 22, verse 16, For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. So David, many centuries before Jesus came into the world, was talking about the death of the Messiah. He was talking about the way in which the Messiah would die, and that is on the cross. The reason why Jesus was nailed to a piece of wood is not because there was anything uh, sacred about the shape of a cross, but he did it to become a curse for us. The Bible says, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And though it wasn't a natural tree, it was a carved tree, it was still a tree, and it was meant to show us that Jesus had become a curse for us by taking the curse meant for us because of our sins upon himself and dying in his place. 
or in our place. But David also prophesied the Messiah would be raised again. We already read about that in Psalm 16 in our call to worship. He writes in verse 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now what this is telling us is that after Jesus, the son of David, was crucified, he was laid in a tomb. He went into the grave. That's what Sheol is. Sheol is not hell. Jesus didn't descend into hell after he died on the cross. Jesus suffered hell on the cross. He descended into Sheol, which is the grave. And if you understand that, it makes sense and why Sheol swallows up all men and why in Sheol there is no worship and praise of God. That's because we're talking about dead bodies. They don't worship and praise God and why the righteous and the wicked are all in Sheol. It's the grave. That's where we all go. Jesus went into the grave, but David tells us he would not be in the grave long enough to decay. He would rise again. And as a matter of fact, we know he rose again on the third day. That's what Jesus was telling his disciples during his earthly ministry. He says in Mark 10, verses 33 and 34, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, who of course will crucify him. They are the ones who did. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. You know what happened when Jesus went to Jerusalem? That's exactly what happened. Jesus was prophesying what was going to take place, and it did take place. But notice after they killed him, put him in the tomb, he would rise again on the third day, and that's exactly what happened. We already saw that there were many eyewitness accounts to that effect. Here is one of them written by Matthew in Matthew 28, verses 1 through 7. We read this. Now, after the Sabbath, that would be the Saturday, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, which is Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guard shook for fear and became like uh, fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, "Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come." see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Yes, the tomb was empty. Jesus was risen from the dead. Jesus appeared to his disciples. He appeared to over 500 at one time. And Paul tells us, last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to him. Now, his death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is the Messiah, the one that the Father promised, the only one who can actually save us. Now, secondly, the resurrection proves that the work that Jesus did, the payment that he made, was actually accepted by his Father. The resurrection was Jesus' vindication from the Father in a variety of ways. We've already seen that it was his vindication that he was the Messiah. That's actually one of the things that Paul means in this passage that I'm going to read now in Romans 1, verses 1 through 4, but he actually means more than that. Paul writes this in Romans 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, and note, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. The resurrection was his vindication that he is in fact the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, the one the Father has sent into the world, the one whom he loves. But, as I've said, secondly, it was a proof the vindication of Jesus that the payment he made was actually accepted by his Father. And how do we know that? 
Well, because if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, if he was still in the grave, he would still be paying the price for the sins that he was bearing. I mean, why did Jesus go into the grave in the first place? It's because the wages of sin is death. Jesus had to die if he was to pay the payment for our sins. So our sins killed him, so to speak. But if those sins remained on him, if that guilt was not paid for, the penalty would still be imposed upon him. He would still be dead. And if that were the case, we would have no hope of the forgiveness of our sins because there would be no payment for sin. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 19, For if the dead are not raised, and they were denying, some of them among them were denying that there was a resurrection. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. See, I want you to, to see the connection here between the resurrection and our salvation. He says that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're, you're trusting in a Savior who himself is dead, and he's under the penalty of death. Your sins actually killed him. Your sins are not forgiven. So you are still in your sins, which means you'll still have to pay for them on that final day because there is no Savior. If there is no resurrection, there's no forgiveness, there's no salvation. And if we have hoped in Christ under these circumstances, it's a false hope. And we are not uh, blessed, but we are of all men most to be pitied. You see, the fact is his resurrection proves that his payment was accepted by the Father. The sins that put him into the grave could not keep him there any longer. And because the Father has accepted what Jesus has done, we have hope because those were our sins that put him in the grave. And if our sins have been paid for and now he's been released from death, that means we have been freed from it as well. That means that we are saved. That's why Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22, what we read for our meditation. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you will live even as he lives. So the resurrection secondly proves that the payment Jesus made was accepted by his Father. Now thirdly, the resurrection proves that Jesus will judge the world on the last day, the day of judgment, when we all stand before God and have to give an account of our lives. One of the things the Father promised Jesus for doing this work was that he would have the honor of sitting in judgment upon the world that sat in judgment on him. Jesus says in John 5, verses 22 through 23, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, there are many people who did not honor the Lord Jesus Christ in life, but when they see themselves standing before him on the day of judgment, they will honor him then because their destiny is in his hands. Now, Paul says the same thing in our passage in Acts 17, verses 30 through 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance... God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. You see, there is a day of judgment and the one who will judge on that day is the man whom he has appointed and the proof that he is the one who is going to do this is the resurrection. By the way, I want you to notice another integral part of the gospel, and that is that there is a day of accountability coming, a day in which all are going to have to stand before God. 
And they're going to have to give an account of their lives. And if they haven't trusted in Jesus, every single sin they have ever committed will be brought up against them, weighed against them in the balances, and they will be punished. Even one sin would be enough to send them to hell forever. But the huge number of sins they will have committed will weigh them down into hell. But if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, He has made a payment for all of your sins. He has clothed you with a perfect righteousness, and you will enter into heaven. Now, Paul reinforces this further in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11, where he says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. Paul says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, most people don't think there's anything to fear, do they? I mean, maybe God doesn't exist, or if he does exist, he's a loving God, and he's not going to send anybody to hell. I mean, doesn't Jesus love everyone on the day of judgment? Isn't he just going to receive everybody into the kingdom? Well, no, the Bible says he isn't going to do that. He will receive into his kingdom those who have loved him, those who have trusted him, those who have turned away from their sins and have followed him. But the Bible also says he will reject those who have not done so. John writes in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, and this is talking about the final judgment focusing on the wicked. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, the Lord Jesus, the one given the honor of judging, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades, or Sheol, gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Are there going to be people in hell? Are there going to be people not received by the Lord Jesus Christ? Clearly, that is the case. Now, we need to understand that hell exists because God is righteous. He is a righteous God. He loves righteousness. He cannot overlook sin. He is just. He must punish sin. That is his nature. He cannot do otherwise. Now, God's love is actually revealed in this, that that being the case, being just and, and having to punish sin, he was willing to make that payment for us by giving us that which was most precious to him, the one whom he loved the most. Love is why the Lord actually warns us to turn away from our sins. When he says to a person who is sinning, and again, the Ten Commandments, the Bible bears out what sin is, when he says that, you're a sinner. It's not because he hates us. It's not because he wants to destroy us. He says that because he wants us to turn away from the things that ultimately will destroy us. By the way, we need to make sure that when we point out somebody's sin, that that is our motive as well, to try to turn them from that sin and not to try to drive the nails through them. You know, the nails of God's judgment and condemnation. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what he calls us to do. But we do have to point out sin because if they don't point out, you know, if they don't turn from that sin, if they don't, they're not convicted that they're, they've done something that's going to condemn them, they're not going to reach out for the Savior. So God, out of his love, tells us what is wrong so that we'll turn away from those things and turn to his Son. Now, by the way, how do we know that there's punishment ahead? Well, the Bible tells us. But the crucifixion also tells us, it proves to us that there is punishment. And it proves to us that God loves us. You see, if we weren't in danger of punishment, why would Jesus have died on the cross? He wouldn't have had to. 
because there would be nothing that threatened us. The fact that he died proves that there was punishment and judgment ahead of us. If he didn't love us, if the Father didn't love us, he wouldn't have sent his Son to die for us. You see, God is just. The, 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 the sin had to be paid for, and so he sent the only one who could do it, the Lord Jesus Christ, to make that payment because of his great love. But that also proves that God is just, and he cannot not be just. If God was going to receive us, if God was going to have us as his sons and daughters, a payment had to be made. That price has to be paid. And he's already paid it through Jesus. And you can trust Jesus and you can receive that or you can make the payment yourself, you see, on that day of judgment. So the crucifixion proves that there is punishment. The, the crucifixion proves that God loves us. But the resurrection proves, again, that Jesus is the Messiah, that the Father has accepted his payment, and it proves that on the day of judgment, he will be the one who sits in judgment on on the entire human race. He will be the judge on that last day. Paul writes in verse 31, He has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now I said there were four things. Finally, the resurrection proves that if we will repent and trust in the Lord Jesus, he will save us from judgment. Jesus paid the price. We've seen he suffered and died for all who would trust in him. The father accepted his payment. If he hadn't, Jesus would still be in the grave, but he's risen from the dead. The fact that he is risen from the dead means that God can forgive. It also means he does forgive all who repent, who turn away from their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus. That's why Paul writes what he does in verse 30 as he's preaching to these philosophers. He says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Now, Paul spoke these words to the philosophers at Athens. Remember, to those who thought they were wise, thought they knew everything, thought that they had, well, basically their eternity was secure. And, of course, they secured it by worshiping these idols, and I know there was a lot that actually went into that as far as how they did that, but they thought they had it all figured out. But they could not, according to the Bible, be reconciled to God through their human wisdom, through their philosophy. They were worshiping these idols in ignorance. They had this whole world system they had worked out. They thought somehow things were going to work out well for them in the end. Men tend to think that regardless of what they believe. But just because they believe it and just because they think it's going to help them doesn't necessarily mean that it will. They were ignorant and they needed to know the truth in order to be saved. But now that the Father had sent Jesus into the world, now that Jesus had completed his work, now that he had been raised from the dead and ascended into heaven and was now seated as the Lord of creation, God was now declaring that all everywhere should turn away from their idols, that he was willing to overlook their ignorance, and that they should worship the Son because the day of his judgment was coming. Now, we've already seen that if we stand before the Lord on that day in our sins, we will be thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is no picnic we read in Scripture that we will be tormented there day and night forever and ever because that is what our sins against an infinitely holy God actually deserve. But if we trust the Savior that the Father has provided in His love, He will forgive us. He will forgive us because Jesus will have already suffered for our sins. You know that, that God is just. He cannot punish sins twice. If you've trusted in Jesus, all your sins have been punished on the cross. He cannot punish you for those sins if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus. He, he's not going to demand a double payment. Jesus paid them once and for all. If you trust in Jesus, your sins are all paid for. If you trust in Jesus, he will clothe you. 
with a perfect righteousness. He'll give you that perfect record you need to enter into heaven. If you trust in Jesus, he will receive you into his eternal kingdom on that day when you stand before him and you will be blessed forever. Let me just encourage you this morning that if you haven't trusted in Jesus, do so now because if you trust in Jesus, not only will you have nothing to fear from the day of judgment, you can actually look forward to it because you know on that day you will be received by him into his kingdom. May the Lord give you the grace to do so if you haven't already trusted him. Let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer.